is the international, the IAU, um, pre former president, specialist in chemistry of nebulae. Okay, let's talk about the steps of the scientific method. We always begin with observations. Then the brain, the brain and the mind will look for patterns to form questions about why this pattern happens. After you have some pattern that you think you see, you will probably come up with a hypothesis, a guess as to um, a mechanism by which this could account for the observations. For too many non-scientists though, this is where the process ends. Maybe they really like their hypothesis and they like it so much they cling to it. They even self-identify with it. If it relates to their political psychological or political philosophical bent, they may deeply self-identify with it and not be very open at all to a critical examination of whether it's really true. But science wants to know not whether it's likable, but is it true? So that's where science comes in. And now we come up with tests. We look for logical, observable consequences of the hypothesis. And the way you help your brain come up with that is you say, well, if this hypothesis X is true, then we ought to be able to see Y. And then you go out and you test for Y. That's a capital Y, in case you're just listening to me and not seeing the slides, X, Y, and Z. Um, and if your test convincingly reveal Y, then you think, wow, this might actually be right. Um, not conclusive yet, okay, it's just on the short list of what's true. But if nature shows that absolutely why is not part of nature, why is anything but what you see, well, you have now successfully ruled out hypothesis X. That's what science is good at, ruling things out. Science is what we do to avoid fooling ourselves. Richard Feynman. Test and test again, ask nature herself if your hypothesis is valid, if it fails even once, then you've ruled it out. Time to find a new hypothesis. But if it passes every test put to it, a hypothesis graduates to the status of a theory. So a theory needs to be taken seriously as a contender for the actual truth. It's no longer just a guess, no longer just an armchair speculation. It's actually passed every reality-based test we put it through. So it's got to be on the short list of the contenders for what the final truth really is. It's unfortunate the popular press confuses the term theory with hypothesis, hypothesis. And I'm trying to be more forgiving of that, although I'm always irritated when I hear that. Um, I'm trying to be more forgiving because the word theory rolls off the tongue so easily and wonderfully. And hypothesis is anything but, okay? It's too many syllables and it's just too much work to say the word. I wish we had a simpler, easier word for hypothesis. And, uh, and then people, maybe people would begin to use that a little more accurately. So what's a good hypothesis? First and foremost, it must be falsifiable. In other words, if it's false, there must be an observable test which shows it is false. Even if the test is technologically too difficult at the moment. This is where hypothesizing supernatural beings who are omnipotent and all-knowing and yet also undetectable and boundaryless will fail. Such vague supernatural hypotheses are not falsifiable which does not mean that they cannot still be ruled out on the illogic of their supposed defining characteristics. Uh, the words that are used, the self-contradictory words that might be used, depends on what you're talking about. But um, yeah, unfortunately, it's a little bit too convenient to have something that is so ill-defined, so boundaryless, that it becomes more of just a... Um, kind of an emotion within you rather than an actual uh, objective thing that can be subjected to test. Uh, second characteristic, prediction should be specific. By this we mean that the hypothesis must be defined and it must have delimited characteristics. If correct, this hypothesis predicts 
you will see this rather than if correct, you should see, maybe see something kind of similar to this sort of thing over here. Okay, that is not specific. You're not going to get anybody very interested in testing your hypothesis if the best that you can come up with for a prediction is something that is that vague and ill-defined. Your, your hypothesis, in other words, has to say something. If you never get beyond vague language, you haven't really said anything. And ideally, and this is often not possible, but it's sure great if it is possible, predictions should ideally be unique. In other words, your hypothesis must have at least one doable test, or should, or hopefully will have, maybe rather than saying must, hopefully will have at least one doable test whose result is not predicted by any other conceived explanation. Then, if it passes that test, you got a pretty good confidence. This, in fact, may be the real deal. This might be the correct explanation. Uniqueness may or may not be possible, but it's exciting to other scientists if it is. We all want to do work that actually advances knowledge. We'll get a lot of people excited and, and work to actually build the technology used to needed to test it. If it really is going to conceive, you know, possibly rule out every other hypothesis, you'll get people excited to do it. Okay, now we're going to talk about something different, the characteristics of a good scientist. So these are now personality characteristics. So first of all, he should accept the reality of an objective world beyond himself. In other words, if he, if he believes he's in the, the matrix and the programming for the matrix could be any old thing, you know, he's probably not going to be all that interested in being a scientist. Um, he should accept that reality is not just a figment of his imagination should accept the reality of an objective world beyond himself. He should have an overriding desire for clarity of understanding. He should have strong curiosity of how things work. And his number one priority is first to discover the truth and what it is, not how he feels about it. Certainly he'll discover whether he wants to or not how he feels about it. But let that come of its own. It shouldn't be his first priority. His priority should be, what is the truth? And I see I lost a word here, didn't I? Discover, and what I should say is what the truth is. Oh, there's a typo. And he, he should accept gracefully that he may not be emotionally comfortable with all of his scientific conclusions. And that that is no reason to reject their truth, okay? So that may be important to remember. I don't know whether I'm going to ask you this or not, but I know I do have a question in my test bank that does test that, okay? So characteristics of a good scientist, this is one that is not a good characteristic. He, well, the, so this, the way I've phrased it, this is a good characteristic. He should accept gracefully that he may not be emotionally comfortable with all his scientific conclusions. He may say, Oh, my God, I really didn't hope that was true. Um, but, geez, I guess, you know, it is true. Dang, my theory is, is, is thrown out. It's ruled out. It's stomped on by these ugly new facts. That was going to be my, my ticket to fortune and glory. And look, at, it's now a tattered ru ruin. It's, it's gone. It's flushed. It's... Uh, Okay, I hope I'm not overdoing it there. So how do you pick ideas? Well, one good rule is Occam's razor. Given two or more ideas, all of which are consistent with current observations, the one which is simplest, in other words, at least conflicts with current best evidence, that's what we mean by simplest, is most likely to be true. But I want to emphasize, this is not foolproof, okay? It does not mean that the simplest, what you think is the simplest idea, is always the truest. It just means if you're going to come up with a hypothesis, try and start with simple stuff first. You'll probably get a quicker payoff to all the grant money that you applied for and all the graduate student hours that you have to pay for. So nature isn't obliged to obey your notions of simplicity. But still, it is shown to be a good, a good way to go. 
Occam's razor. Sagan's corollary. Extraordinary claims should require extraordinary evidence, so it's kind of the opposite side. Extraordinary claims, therefore, should require extraordinary evidence if you're going to take them seriously. It's the best protection against getting pulled in by those who want you to buy into their perhaps poorly motivated system. Don't expect proof by loud assertion to carry weight with thinking people. Recent politics is a warning sign. Claim that the light in the sky you saw last night was a spaceship from another planet? It better show convincingly that all the more conventional explanations fail. And even that's going to be a pretty hard job unless you've got some pretty good evidence besides just your memory of what you saw. Um, so how do you evaluate the validity of claims that you hear out there? So maybe most of you are not planning on becoming scientists. Still, you're going to want to know something about science, something about the scientific attitude that I'm trying to convey here in just dealing with things like uh, medical stuff. Okay, Who hasn't uh, felt pain and wanted to get rid of it? You're going to be confronted with how do you deal with that. So consider a medical claim, something that all of us are going to face regularly. Here's what I do. First, I'll Google it. Okay, I'll search for first published science and journal papers and quality journals. I'll not go to blog sites and I'll certainly not go to sites where there's a financial motivation okay, for people to hype it. So I want to go to uh, objective peer-reviewed science papers published by journals that don't have an X to grind. Now in, in the medical and drug area I will confess that can be harder. There's money, there's big money involved in drugs. And so even if you find something published in a real journal, it may still be the victim of things like p-hacking and other stuff that, uh, so it's, it's very difficult to, uh, it's difficult. So I guess that's why it's worth going over a little bit. So I pay attention to whether the journal was a real respected journal or a trade journal. Trade journals are journals that are not supported financially by the actual scientists, by their annual dues. They are journals that are supported by their corporations. And so they have a profit-driven motive. And so I wouldn't trust anything in a trade journal. If you can't find anything but blog sites, promotionals, and trade journal claims, I'd be pretty skeptical. Um, we also have to think about the placebo effect. <clears throat> so pain's our organism signal that something's wrong and we need to up our awareness and do something to fix the problem. Uh, if you do something, even if it's not, in fact, ultimately the right thing, but even if you just do something that's plausible and you think you really have, perhaps, maybe, hopefully, helped your problem, then your organism will dial down the pain signal to some extent. It'll say, okay, you listen to me. You listen to the pain and now you've done something and maybe it'll even work. I'll dial down the pain a little bit and we'll just, uh, we'll wait and we'll see. Your stress levels will reduce as well. That'll improve your cortisol levels. Chronic stress is a well-verified danger to physical health. And so even just this aspect could in fact be healing to some extent. The placebo effect all by itself, just because of the stress effect can uh, give you a, a bit of genuine healing. Um, if I found a study in a high quality journal like JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine, I'd look to see whether it had a large sample of patients, large sample, with a large sample size. You don't want to just hear about Aunt Mabel and the fact that, you know, that fixed her bunion or whatever. Uh, I'd look to see if it was placebo controlled. This is vitally important for any malady based on pain perception. Some things uh, are you know, like if you're trying to heal a broken bone, well, you can take x-rays and see how fast the bone heals. You don't have to rely on pain perception. <clears throat> but things that require subjective experiencing uh, pain scales, those are touchy and iffy and you know, should be suspicious. And that's why we often do double blind studies where neither the patient or the doctor knew if they're getting the real stuff until after the study was over to further guard against psychological influences from the physician on the patient. 
I'd also want to look to see how the study was funded. If it was funded through a private profit-oriented corporation to test their drug, and they've definitely got money in the game, and they really have a interest in making sure that you show that their drug really works, well, I'd be very skeptical. But if it passed all these tests and showed a real effect, I'd tend to accept it. Um, but yeah, you got to be wary of industry-sponsored science because it instead could be agenda-driven non-science or nonsense, as it were. So here's um, something I found uh, a while back. Plastics industry funded studies on BPA, bisphenol A, and whether it was damaging to health. And out of 12 studies, 12 of them showed no effect. Oh my God, this sounds perfectly safe. But government funded studies, like by the National Science Foundation or the US Department of Health and Human Services and et cetera, they found that, wow, 128 out of 139 studies did find adverse health effects. Those are the ones I tend to, I tend to believe, not the profit-oriented plastics industry. Okay, question for you guys. Does the new skin cream work? Patients who did not use the new skin cream, 107 got better, and 21, the rash got worse. Patients who did use the new skin cream, 223 got better, but 75 got worse. And the answer is no, the new skin cream does not work. Patients who did not use the skin cream actually had a better success rate. So the placebo effect was probably in operation here. Um, now if the substance isn't patentable, there may legitimately be no group wanting to spend for the big large scale study. And so even if it actually works, it's like, well, there's no big profit here for us. So we're not gonna invest a lot of money to test it. Then you often really have to count on academic researchers to do the work and get, um, get funded without uh, having profit in the way. But maybe they're not interested either. Maybe they're doing other stuff. I don't know. Um, I'm actually curious right now about, about something. I'll just go ahead and mention it to you. So um, I have an old friend and, and uh, she is a believer that grounding, that having your body grounded, uh, electrically grounded to the earth as often as possible during the day is a positive health effect, has positive health effects. And if you don't, you know, if you're constantly insulated, electrically insulated from the earth, the ground, the uh, conducting ground of the earth, then it has um, poor health effects in, in many different ways. And so I think that's interesting. Um, is that true or not? Well, it's very tempting to say, oh, it sounds like a bunch of new age hogwash. But then I think to myself, you know, for most of our evolution as people, as humans, we didn't have shoes and we did spend most of our time insulated to the ground. And it is true that the biochemistry of people is going to be influenced by the electrical charge that we carry. So it isn't per se ridiculous. I know it might sound like it might be ridiculous, but I think um, it really pays to be open-minded on that. So I've, I've tried to look up some, some good studies on it, and I, I did find one or two, and there's probably more to do, but I'm too busy right now. It looks like there might actually be something there, okay? So uh, I, I guess the point of mentioning that is I would not be too quick to throw cold water on something. You might already be getting the feeling that, oh, Rick has probably got you know his ice water just ready to pour on almost everything. He's such a scientist. Um, but no, I really try to keep an open mind. And, uh, you know, so that's one. I'm, I'm not really sure whether that's right or wrong. It's not like homeopathy, which is very different. Homeopathy says you can take some healing substance and then dilute it to the point where there are actually no more atoms of it in the, the water that you're carrying around. And yet it'll still, the water itself will still heal you. Um, that, frankly, sounds pretty ridiculous to me. Um, there's certainly no theory that would justify what that, but what there is is a, certainly a, a great a great way to lower your costs. Okay, if you're going to generate homeopathic medicines, you can dilute them down to zero, 
wow, your costs have just now gone for the raw materials gone to zero. So it's a little bit uh, suspicious. Um, okay, I'm going to keep going here. Oh, okay, well, as long as we, we are doing this medical stuff. Orange Indian Spice Turmeric, which has curcumin in it. So there is pretty good evidence that that is uh, anti-inflammatory. In fact, uh, plants, many, many types of plants, spices and herbs, they, they have to sit out in the sun all day long, and they've got to fight the effects of oxidation that come from all the ultraviolet light that they get because they can't go hide under a rock like a, an animal can. And so it is true there are antioxidants in plants that are very good for you. And I even had my doctor recommend that, yeah, you know, if you want to avoid, you know, you want to lower your inflammation and maybe, uh, you know, after training and so forth and you get your muscles get tired, then uh, try, uh, try uh, turmeric. Frankly, it's not that interesting a spice, I have to say. Very colorful, but, um, you know, I've tasted more flavorful spices. But, you know, I've gone ahead and I, I have a couple of teaspoons a day with a little bit of pepper to make it work and uh, I hope it helps. Anyway, it's not that expensive, so why not? Um, yeah, so that comes up to the last thing and that is uh, if nobody will pay for it, but it's clearly safe and there's some plausibility to it, hey, go ahead and try it. You know, I'm not going to criticize you. I don't criticize me for trying stuff if it uh, has some possible plausibility. Uh, and then this is climate, so I think I'm going to skip over that.